Welcome back to part four, everybody. Now this is clogging foods. This is, this is our category four. Absolutely none of this during the 60-day program. And then later on, if you really feel self-indulgent sometimes, well, knock yourself out, but just make sure you take your enzymes. A glazed donut is nature's most perfect food. What is a glazed donut? It is partially hydrogenated soybean oil, white sugar, white flour, and air. Hydrogenated? Oil snacks, which is like everything. Potato chips, all the pretzels, the salty snacks, the cookies, the donuts, the pies, the cakes. Margarine. Margarine is out of the question. I used to do a whole section on margarine. Do you know that like, if, if you accidentally, you ever notice how if you accidentally leave like half a stick of margarine out on the counter that gets hidden behind your, your toaster or something, and then a week later you discover it, and you, you pick it up and you go, damn, it's still good, you know? And then try this one. Take that margarine and put it out on your porch, outside your porch door, and just leave it on the ground for a couple days. Guess what? You come back there, there will be no bugs near it. No self-respecting bug will, will, will touch margarine. It has, it has nothing for him. It has no food value. He, can't, he, can't, he knows he can't break it down. You know, it's complete TFAs, trans, fat, trans fats. Mayonnaise is out of the question. It's out of the question. Unless, you know, if you make organic, natural mayonnaise yourself, that's different, but not Miracle Whip or anything you buy commercially, no. No, no. Diet anything. Uh, yeah, I, I really don't have time to talk about that. But there's a whole chapter. It's called Sugar, the Sweet Thief of Life. And we go into a discussion of aspartame, Splenda, NutraSweet, uh, all the artificial sweeteners. I just say, you know, a lot of women trying to stay slim, they will always be ordering Diet Cokes. And I go, look, just order the freaking Coke if that's your choice. That'll, that'll just make you overweight. The diet soft drink is going to give you cancer. Major neurotoxin and carcinogen. There's no question about it. And then soy in any form. Soy in any form. So I really don't have time to go through that discussion. I'll just say that in, in my chapter called uh, The Magic Bean on my website, we go through a discussion of how in 1996, this is when Monsanto uh, was mo motivated to introduce the genetic modification of our major crops in the United States, beginning with soybeans. The upshot is today, any soybeans produced in the United States is considered to be genetically modified. That's true. And people always say, well, the Japanese eat them all the time. No, only as condiments, only as condiments. Yeah, that's right. No tofu. Excellent question. Excellent question. Dr. Salvatore just asked, isn't it true that if it's organic, it can't be GMO? The answer is, it's unregulated. So in the United States, if it's soybeans grown in the United States, it's considered genetically modified. Watch the entire movie, The Future of Food. It'll show you these farms uh, in Canada and in, in the Midwest. And at the beginning of the introduction of genetically modified soy into American agricultural fields, you'd have a field of normal soy, and then you'd have a truck that would drive by loaded with Monsanto's genetically modified soy, right? And then by accident, some of the genetically modified soy would blow off the truck and get mixed in with the natural soy. And then Monsanto went into those farmers' fields and sued them for stealing their invention, even though it blew off their trucks. And they won. Monsanto won that. So that's a great movie. The general answer to your question is absolutely not. Uh, the term organic, like I say, it's political but it does not preclude GM. It's, it was originally supposed to, but it's completely uninfo unenforced. That's from Jeff, Jeffrey Smith's book. Okay, and then finally there's coffee. Coffee is a big problem. I don't care what you read. Uh, there's no coffee in the 60-day program. Tea is fine, not coffee. Uh, it's not really the caffeine. 
Here are your condiments. First of all, here are your sauces. No sauces. <laughs> Salad dressings are lemon juice and balsamic vinegar, not vinaigrette, because that's oil. Salt and pepper are fine. No cooking oils because of unregulated labeling, because it's processed and it's just too dense. So those, those are the reasons for no cooking oils, no salad dressing oils for 60 days. TFAs and free radicals produce from even the best cooking oils. They have a tendency to be rendered into hard fats, plaque, and cellulite. Yes, essential fatty acids are really important. They're really good, but you don't need to get them from cooking oils. We already talked about seeds and nuts, right? So there's the picture. No seeds, no nuts. It seems very restrictive. Sometimes it seems very restrictive to say, oh, I'm only going to eat from category one or two all this time for 60 days. But, you know, lentils, beans, legumes, even pickles are fine. You know, so it's just find the fruits and vegetables that you like. That's the worst thing about the program is that it's so much work. You always are going and buying fruits and vegetables and a lot of them go bad. You have to throw them out and you have to keep this rotation going. That's the worst part of it. It's, the, it's so much work to do that. That's what everybody says. After about two weeks, the, the surprising thing to me was that I thought, you know, everybody talks about, well, soft drinks and uh, cookies and all the sweet snacks are the worst of all. They're, how can I make it without my ice cream, you know, and so addicting, the, the white sugars. After two weeks, if, if you really follow through and really restrict yourself, after two weeks, you stop missing it. It's like no big deal. It's, it's, it's not like heroin. It's definitely not like, not, not like smoking. Nothing like that. It's a mild addictor. Here's my slide on the problems with coffee. You guys want to see this? Because yeah. people say, it's an antioxidant and all this stuff. You read it on Wikipedia and it's whatever. Here's a problem with coffee. Number one, it is a general vasoconstrictor. Does that sound like a good thing you want to do during a period where we're, we're trying to detox our entire arterial system? Not really. Coffee lowers the pH of the digestive tract and the blood. So it is a whole body acidifier. What's the problem with that? Well, when you acidify in an enzyme system, especially digestive enzymes, it inhibits digestion. Coffee inhibits digestion. See, I lived, in, I lived in Sicily for two years, and you have all those Italian dudes standing up drinking their cappuccinos every freaking hour, and all these dudes are thin. The women don't drink it. See, and the women are not thin in Sicily, okay? When you're constantly acidifying the digestive tract and the blood, our buffering system has, has to keep the pH of, of the blood artificially shorn up to the normal range, 7.3 to 7.45. It requires calcium to constantly be shoring up that pH. Where does it get the calcium from, the extra calcium, after it takes all what it can get from the blood? There's only 500 milligrams in the blood at any one time. It goes to the bones and teeth. So this is the short version of how coffee causes osteoporosis. Another bad thing about coffee is that it kills the probiotics. We're going to talk about the importance of probiotics this afternoon. Coffee exhausts the adrenals because it's always a sympathetic stimulator, fight or flight. You're always in ready, set, <laughs> that kind of thing. So you like that all the time. Uh, so it's this, the whole sympathetic override effect on the endocrine system, wasting all that energy. And it, you know, people go, well, I don't have any energy unless I have my coffee in the morning. Hey, that is not energy. That jolt is the illusion of energy. It's your body responding to the non-food in, in the system. It's the sympathetic jolt. It actually w makes you tired because of the metabolic stores that are required in order to try and process this non-food out of the system. That's why people who drink coffee all the time need it because they're tired from all their metabolics used up trying to metabolize the coffee out, which results in a net drain of metabolic energy. So I'm not buying 
nobody who studies the physiology behind coffee is buying that coffee gives you energy. And it's the same thing and worse with Red Bull. It's like a plot against our youth. And there's a whole bunch of them now. Premature aging. Yeah, most coffee is not organic. It's loaded up with pesticides. This is why coffee does not belong in the 60-day program, and it really does not belong in the long-term health program of somebody who's doing everything they can to for longevity and to remain disease-free. It's an immune suppressor. Overall, it's, coffee is, a, is an immune suppressor. We were talking about Weston A. Price, and he went to all those isolated uh, geographic areas. Here's some of the places that he went to discover those healthiest people on Earth. How, now, how many of you have ever read this book? Yeah, it's excellent, isn't it? And it's real easy to read, and it's got a ton, ton of pictures. He has a lot of pictures in there. I would like to have met him. He died in 1948, though. When you read a guy like Weston A. Price, you read that whole book, and then you go, the dude died in 1948. He was so far ahead of where we are right now. What about the benefit of the Internet? Hey, we're not getting smarter necessarily, you know, unless you look for it. I'm just talking about the, the overall awareness of people, it's constantly the fads, you know, the, the certain diets that come out in order to promote one, one sort of book or one type of company or whatever. The principles of optimum nutrition for the human race, they have already been elaborated, studied, clinically tested, and laid out clear as day. One of my favorite topics, the gluten myth here, I call this alternative light. L-I-T-E, you know, like Miller Light, Bud Light. You really see this in stores now. Like Safeway, you know, they're doing whole aisles of, of gluten-free. So here, here's, a, here's an example of this. Here's a gluten-free chocolate cake. Like that thing's going to be healthy because they took all the gluten out of it. It's like, give me a break, you know. So they, they use that to market ridiculously unhealthy foods. Gluten is the, the protein portion of the grain. It is not allergenic in itself. The toxicity of the food, the allergenicity of the food, is something that's determined by what? By the percentage of partially hydrogenated soybean oil, high fructose corn syrup, pasteurized dairy, and other processed foods in it. Not by how much gluten it has in it. It's just a, it's a major buzzword now in order to market a whole line like of unhealthy foods. Like, skyrocketed in the last six months, I've, I've noticed that the number of foods that have whole shelves of gluten. Let's talk about weight loss for five minutes here. I used to do a whole section on this. Remember that weight loss is primarily a $60 billion a year industry in the U.S. predicated on the idea that you should only freak out and address your weight problem when you get up to the panic levels and then you starve yourself and then you drop down to, the, to something more normal at which time you begin to indulge yourself and so you do this roller coaster. So of course I always think of my, my mom who was in Weight Watchers for like 50 years or something and that's what they did. They watched their weight, you know, which never changed. So, I mean, that's a great business. Does Weight Watchers want people to, to normalize their weight? Of course not. You know, they would be out of business. Now, here's some statistics. 21% of children, this is off the CDC, 21% of children are obese today. Now, that doesn't mean overweight. 33% of adults are obese today. That doesn't mean overweight. Overweight is closer to 60 in both these instances. Obesity is something more specific. The average person drinks 216 liters of soft drinks per year. The average person eats 125 grams of protein per day as opposed to the 25 grams of protein we actually need. And the average person today consumes 160 pounds of white sugar per year. How many pounds of white sugar does the average person need per year? Zero, right. So no wonder we have diabetes shooting up at the rate we talked about. So my contention is this. You don't even have to think about weight loss. You know, if you, you come at this program, like the 60-day program, and your goal, you're really, really overweight, my contention is that just forget about the weight. Don't even think about it. Just do the program because 
The only way somebody's weight is going to normalize is if their lifestyle normalizes. And once your lifestyle normalizes, your weight will normalize forever. It's so simple. Here's a good breakfast recommendation for 60-day program. You want to hear this? You get a blender, right? You dump the coconut juice in there. You put a, a banana in. Cut up some strawberries if you want to. Get some organic orange juice. And then I put in like three tablespoons of collagen and any other kind of fruit that you want to. But I mean like it's almost like a full, it's a lot, right? It's like three, four glasses, right? So then you blend that puppy up. I always take my supplements with that while I'm drinking it. You just take your time. You stand there and drink all that down. You take your supplements, your, your, your minerals, your enzymes, flora. I'm telling you, you do that at breakfast time, you are totally good to go to 1 o'clock because you have not done anything that's going to burden you anything that's going to give you indigestion or it's going to block your digestive tract. No, it's all nutrition. Everything is going to be in the positive direction from that kind of a, a breakfast. Then that becomes one third of your meals in the week. You're on your way. And believe me, it's not that difficult. This whole bacon, eggs, and coffee thing is the recipe for a very sick culture. Once we started pasteurizing milk, right around 1900, I have a chapter on this on my website. It really went into the history and the politics of how that, that really happened, how big dairy demonized the, the natural milk industry, which actually had existed on the planet for 200,000 years, right? Since we've been domesticating cows, right? And suddenly they made everybody think that milk that isn't, you know, heated, having all its enzymes denatured, anything but that is dirty. How they pervade that mentality to the American public, it's really a masterpiece of propaganda. So that this is in a chapter on my website. But raw milk really is one of nature's most perfect foods. Once we started pasteurizing milk, we converted that food into a devised enzymeless food. So you all know that pasteurized means the milk uh, has all its enzymes removed by heating. Traditionally, this was accomplished by heating the milk to 160 Fahrenheit for 17 seconds. Today, we do it the ultra-high temperature way, 285 degrees Fahrenheit for two seconds. Now, the first time I saw that, I thought to myself, gee, I wonder what happens the third second. So a lot of people, when I, when I start preaching how they should stop giving milk to their children because it's the number one cause of childhood allergies and asthma, they're, they're immediately freaking out, thinking, but where will my baby get his calcium? That's what they want to know. Where will my baby get his calcium? The answer to that question is, first of all, calcium is one of the, it's probably the only mineral that there, there is not really a deficiency in from foods. Calcium is in most foods. It's in most fruits and most vegetables. The problem with pretending you're getting calcium from milk is that there's an enzyme in milk called phosphatase, which is necessary for humans to absorb calcium from the milk, right? By definition, this enzyme must be denatured in pasteurization. The child is getting very little calcium from pasteurized dairy in the first place. Yeah, it, you know, this is, this is a really difficult thing to, to teach parents who have, you know, little kids, you know, toddlers and young, young children, five years old, who are beginning to exhibit chronic allergies. The, and th their diet might not even be that bad, but it's just that they're, drinking, they're, they're making them drink all this milk. You know, it might not even be a, a lot of ice cream, but they, you know, and then they want to take the kid to the, the genius at Kaiser Permanently Disabled, right? And, uh, you know, and then they're, they're on the merry-go-round and they're on the Benadryl, and they, they, they don't even put this together like, you're causing the problem by forcing them, the ki and the kids don't even like milk. That's the other thing, I hear these kids, mommy, I don't want this. No, you have to, my darling, da 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 It's like, whoa. And so, uh, this, is, this is very hard to 
convince people of. But here's the thing. I'm definitely not alone in this. Okay, this is not a theory. This is not a theory. This is something that virtually all holistic nutritionists, we're some strange monkeys in general, I'll admit, but this is, this is one area, excuse me, when we're on the same page. You got a child who is beginning to exhibit being uh, allergenic, asthmatic. The first thing you do is you get that kid off all pasteurized dairy for 60 days. No milk, no cheese, no butter, no ice cream, no yogurt, right? Just try it for 60 days and don't, even, don't make any other alterations to the diet. You'll see a night and day difference. That is one of the most difficult things that I've found to get people to try that, to even consider that it's true. Very difficult because of cultural conditioning. Again, this is not my idea. The big boys knew this 50 years ago and more. Royal Lee said back in the day, pasteurized milk is incapable of rebuilding or maintaining bones and teeth. Henry Beeler said, commercially modified milk and baby foods are all foreign to the baby's digestion. This guy was a genius. He was down here somewhere back in the day. He, really? Do you know some people who knew, knew him? Whoa, whoa. Some older people? Wow. I'd like to talk to you about that because his books are fantastic. You know, He's one of these guys. We're talking about um, Henry Beeler. He was... Uh, he was, uh, they, they called him the, the doctor to the stars. He, he treated a lot of movie stars in the 60s, naturally and stuff. But um, he, was, he was one of these MDs who, who did not believe in drugs, and he, he, did, he had his whole natural protocol. If you ever get a book by Hen Henry Beeler, yeah, that's it. Food is your best medicine. In fact, that's your note, number 22. Bernard Jensen, he was down here somewhere too, right? Yeah. Did, you, did you know that Bernard Jensen was actually nominated for the Nobel Prize and then they withdrew the nomination when they found out he was a chiropractor? That's true. Okay, back to milk. Milk has been changed over the years, this is Kurt Oster, MD, by processing into an unrecognizable physical chemical emulsion which bears little resemblance to the original natural nutritional milk. Why children should never be given, okay we already talked about this, and this is what all holistic nutritionists agree on. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about that? But if you have patients who have kids who obviously are having these asthmatic and allergic uh, problems, this is the most important adjunct to a program of chiropractic adjustments if you can convince them to do this. Now, um, I've done some work for you if you can get them to read the chapters on my website. I'm a sort of, have sort of an iconoclastic personality, I guess, but because as soon as somebody suggested this to me at the very beginning, I had no resistance to it whatsoever. It, it made perfect sense to me, but it just amazes me how resistant to logic in, the, in this instance. And something so important is your freaking little kid can't breathe at night, you know? Try something. Get a clue. Yeah, so there it is. No pasteurized dairy for 60 days. This is from Jeffrey Smith's book, Your Note, number six. GMO trilogy. That's a picture of confined dairy farming eating their GMO corn husks. Some of them are hooked up to machines constantly. In 1991, a product was invented called Pozilac. Pozilac is, is the milk from cows who have been maintained on recombinant bovine growth hormone invented by Da -da -da -da. The Prince of Darkness, right? Monsanto. It's oh, 1994. But there was, there was no long-term safety study. It was, done, it was approved after a 90-day study on 30 rats. This is a program that affected the entire dairy industry in the United States, approved after they did a, a study for 90 days on 30 rats, right? The other thing was that they, the amounts that they used in the study were really small and then they started giving way more. Anyway, the FDA declare, declared this growth hormone safe with no proof. So wait a minute, how does it work? Okay, the cow is shot up with the hormone, the synthetic hormone, and what does it do? Well, it makes the cow lactate continuously for three years, nonstop. A cow can be forced to lactate continuously for three years 
after which it's just practically dead. They just let it out on the field and it, it collapses and then they sell it for dog food or something. But the problem is, how do normal cows give milk for human consumption? They bear a calf every year. That's it. And if the cow bears, bears a calf every year, the cow can keep giving natural milk for, Tim Zeiler told me, like up, up to, what do you say, 12 or 15 years sometimes. He's a chiropractor up north. And here's the other thing that Jeffrey Smith will teach you. We never studied it. We just believed it. When Monsanto introduced growth hormone, the FDA believed their data that they gave them. The Canadians did this elaborate study, this huge study of recombinant bo bovine growth hormone to see if they wanted to use it in their country. And here's what they discovered. In the original studies, the prescribed injection for a cow was 10 milligrams per day. That's how they got it approved. 10 milligrams per day of the growth hormone is what they patented Pazilek on. In actual practice, they're giving them 500 milligrams at, at a time every two weeks. So this jacks up the cow's hormone levels to a thousand times of normal. Now their claim was, Monsanto's claim was, we need to do this to provide you know, starving people food or more milk. Claim of 30% more milk. Here's the problem. The growth hormones stimulated another hormone in the cows. This is actually a, a normal hormone in cows and people called IGF-1, which inhibited cell death a thousand times normal. Now, in teals, the milk-producing glands will start to fade away by, by programmed cell death, apoptosis, right? But if, if you give them this hormone, it inhibits cell death. So think about that concept. Think about inhibiting the cell death of lacteals. Okay? We're talking about what pathology does that seem to promote and introduce? Anybody? Yeah, of course. Breast cancer. And, and the thing is, here's the thing. In women, you know, it's ridiculous now. In, in, in the U.S., one woman in eight gets breast cancer. We have this you never outgrow your need for milk, milk mustache thing in the 90s, remember? You know, we want to market milk to adults, right? That's when this really happened, this, this enormous upswing in uh, the percentage of women getting breast cancer. And you can, you can almost link it to this because it's the amount of IGF-1 because it's transferred from, it's in, it stays in the milk and becomes active in the human's body, even though they pretend like that's not true. IGF-1 is a powerful growth hormone in humans and cows that causes cells to divide. It can cause cancer in children. Here's another thing. I'm, I'm about to show this slide about children cancer. This is one of the most logical explanations for this sudden recent spiking of cancer among children. Yeah. Now let's see. IGF-1 boosts not just milk output, but the cow's entire metabolism. Cow milks out in three years instead of 15. That's right. Milk producers claim that IGF-1 is destroyed by pasteurization. That's a complete lie. It's not. It's also not destroyed in the human gut when you drink the milk. They pretend like it's destroyed in the human gut. It's not. It persists and it reacts in the human endocrine system. This was the name of this, okay, this is your note number six. It was called the GAPS Analysis Report. It was a huge, very elaborate study that they did when they were considering allowing this type of milk in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Caused, they discovered it was causing huge birth defects, reproductive disorders, tumors, infections in the cows, not in humans, in the cows. And so the reason that they made this type of milk, Pazilek, illegal in Canada was because of the danger to cows, not the danger to people. So Canada protects its cows better than we protect our people. So you can read that whole story in Jeffrey Smith. There it is, Seeds of Deception. That's an excellent book. That's a really essential book. Okay, so like I said, Premenopausal women with high IGF-1s are seven times more likely to develop breast cancer. 
So where would they be getting this high IGF-1 levels? From drinking milk, from high dairy intake. Same thing with men. Men are four times more likely to develop prostate cancer with high IGF levels. Where would they be getting that high IGF levels from drinking milk? All these spikes took place after this marketing of milk to adults in the late 90s. Yeah, right out of Jeffrey Smith's book. Now, most countries said no way. Canada banned the hormone in 99. Yeah. Uh, the EU, New Zealand, Australia, Japan banned it too. The UN even banned Pazilac. In 07, so did Starbucks. Like if, when you go to Starbucks today and ask for milk in your coffee or a smoothie, they, they have to use organic milk, which has no, no hormones. Organic milk has no hormones. You, you, you know that, right? Organic milk, that, by definition, and they do regulate that. Here's the thing. The United States is the only country in the world where when you walk into Safeway and you buy that gallon of milk with the red top, is going to be pasteurized, homogenized, and it's going to be bovine growth hormone cow. It's going to be loaded with IGF-1. We are the only country in the world where that is true. No labeling. No labeling. That's how powerful the dairy industry is. No labeling. Yeah. So the FDA ignored the advice of their own scientists and approved it. Yeah. Jeffrey Smith, page 99. Okay. Oh, okay, the Cassain myth, the Cassain myth, just like the gluten myth. They pretend like the problems with milk are, are due to its Cassain content. Now, Cassain is, a, is the protein in milk, right? So we're going to solve the problems of milk by removing the Cassain. We're still going to homogenize it, and we're still going to pasteurize it. It's complete hysteria and falsification of any kind of valid science. If a child has allergies or asthma, you are not going to remedy that problem by giving them casein-free pasteurized dairy. The only way you can remedy it is by either cutting the milk out completely or by giving the child raw milk. And with that, we are going to conclude this section and come back after lunch and finish up.